ki namaste good morning and a very warm welcome to you all it is my pleasure and honor to introduce professor binoy k behel an award winning art historian photographer filmmaker author buddhist scholar and world traveler over the past 46 years mr behel has taken over 53000 photographs of asian monuments and art heritage and made 145 documentaries which are regularly screened at major cultural institution worldwide his photographic exhibitions have been warmly received in 74 countries around the world uh, these have been inaugurated by ministers of the government from various countries ambassadors archbishops and other dignitaries He holds the Limca Book Record for being the most traveled photographer and art historian. Mr. Behel is most well known for photographing the scarcely seen Buddhist paintings of Ajanta for the first time in their true color and detail. His books, The Ajanta Caves and the Art of India, sculptures and mural paintings in two volumes, his film including 26 documentary on the painting of India. 26 documentary on the sculpture of india and 26 documentaries on spectacular india have been nationally telecast on prime time in india as well as repeat telecast these have also been screened at scores of universities and museums in several countries around the world in january 2008 national geographic magazine uh, carried an 18 page story about ancient indian art revealed through bell's photograph to the world he is the first indian whose work was featured in national geographic magazine furthermore bbc world news carried three major stories about bell's pioneering work in india and vietnam as we embark on this five week course bell will take us on a remarkable journey that explores mural painting the birth of deities and the expansion of indian art and appreciation over the course of ancient and medieval times mr behel has selected specific films for this course from the series of 52 documentary films on indian paintings sculptures and development of buddhism early indian art embodies deep philosophical concepts and a deeply ethical vision of life as a member of indian community it is both an enriching and important experience for us all to learn of our great heritage now without further ado please join me in welcoming our prestigious educator mr behel to the screen thank you thank you very much uh, mr arun parker it's such a pleasure to uh, to address again the audience of uh, the hindu temple at uh, minnesota five years ago when i had the pleasure of uh, visiting there and uh, uh, speaking to your uh, audience good morning ladies and gentlemen it was in uh, 1991 that i had the privilege of photographing the uh, 5th century paintings of ajanta i was told for the first time in their uh, true colors and uh, details you would be happy to know that uh, museums and universities around the world immediately invited me to come and speak and to show these uh, marvelous paintings so in the usa it was the Smithsonian Institution the Metropolitan Museum of Art the Harvard University the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and so many others and it was also the the British Museum in London the Victoria and Albert Museum the University of London and a, and a score of other such institutions around the world now you would be most happy to know that uh, the, uh, the the most important uh, art critics and uh, art historians were gathered in these uh, capitals of culture of the world to see these uh, ajanta paintings and there was a unanimous response to them 
they all felt that surely these must be the finest art of humankind. They explained to me with great uh, care and detail that there was much in these uh, fifth century Indian paintings, which was, uh, which reached European art only a thousand years later in the time of the late uh, Renaissance. And much in these paintings, much technical virtuosity in these paintings, which was found only in Western art by the time of uh, the Impressionist paintings and the Expressionist paintings, and even qualities which came up in modern art in the West. Uh, some of these they found in these fifth century paintings. But more than that, what made these paintings truly so beautiful and made them so important to the world was a vision of life which they contained. It was a vision of life which saw the same in you and in me, in all the people, the flowers, the trees, the animals in the world. It saw a great unity in the whole of creation. And obviously, this imparted a great sense of compassion to every line, every nuance being made by the painters. Now, the uh, philosophy of aesthetics was highly developed at an early stage in India. In this philosophy, it is understood that our experience, when we look at something truly beautiful, whether in nature, like a beautiful sunrise, or in art, like perhaps uh, an Ajanta paintings, our experience in that moment, our response in that moment is akin to Brahmananda itself, the final ecstasy of salvation itself. For in that moment, the veils of illusion are lifted and we are seeing the uh, grace which underlies all of creation. Therefore, you can understand that uh, art was considered enormously important and there was the making of uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, sculptures and paintings right across the large number of temples and caves which were created across uh, the Indian subcontinent. Now in these uh, paintings that you're going to see, you're going to see many beautiful deities. When you look upon these deities, it is important to remember that in the ancient philosophic tradition, the Indian philosophic tradition coming from the Upanishads, there are no gods, there are deities. These deities are personifications of concepts and the qualities within us. They, we look upon these uh, sculptures and paintings, we look upon these deities and we meditate upon these deities and it, we respond to them. And in that response, we awaken those qualities within us, the grace, compassion, kindness, wisdom that there is deep within us is awakened. And it is hope that one day those qualities will fill us completely. And at that point, you have become the deity. So such was the importance of uh, art in uh, ancient uh, India. Uh, here we are at uh, that enchanted place, that gorge of the Vaghura River in Maharashtra in Western India, where 31 caves were excavated, hewn out of the living rock in two phases. The first phase around the second century BCE and the second phase around the fifth century CE. And these caves were marvelously sculpted with pillars and with uh, sculptures and with uh, beautiful paintings along uh, all their walls and their uh, ceilings. And um, because uh, the Archaeological Survey of India feared the effect of uh, light upon the paintings, 
strong lights were not allowed inside. In fact, whatever lights that were used were uh, running on uh, electricity coming through a dimmer at a low voltage and casting only orangish light upon the paintings as it was feared that the upper part of the color spectrum of the light, the blues and greens, would cause uh, the paintings to fade uh, very early. So this is how the uh, paintings of Ajanta were seen and known to be. And still, they were considered enormously important because they were considered to be the fountainhead of the classic tradition of painting in Asia. However, I had the good fortune to develop a technique of uh, photography mm -hmm. in uh, dark conditions. And with that, I managed to capture the true colors of the painting as you see here. So the blues and greens and the details of the paintings uh, were brought out. And this is what uh, the world was uh, extremely happy to see. Now, there was also a great deal of damage on the paintings. What you see here is actually an enormously important painting. It is a painting in cave 10 of Ajanta, which is of the uh, second century BCE. Now that's a period of time when uh, only the most crude attempts at painting were being made in uh, most of the world. It's uh, a very, very early time in the history of painting. And uh, these paintings could not clearly be seen because of the amount of uh, damage, graffiti on them. So 20 years ago, I uh, sat down with a great deal of uh, patience and care and digitally uh, restored uh, the damage of these, uh, on these paintings. So this way the paintings became uh, clearer for the eye to see. And what a treasure emerges. What a treasure for the second century BCE. If you were to look at these paintings, there are uh, expressions uh, already, sensitive expressions already in that uh, period of time. There is the exchange of glances. And most marvelously, the inward look which is the hallmark of uh, the ancient art of India, is already there in this very early period of art. So this is, uh, this is the great uh, heritage which becomes uh, visible uh, through this uh, uh, little digital restoration to, to bring the paintings uh, clearly before us. Now, coming back to the uh, fifth century, we are again in uh, cave one of Ajanta. And this is the Bodhisattva Vajrapani. Bodhisattva, as you know, is a being on his way to salvation. And Vajrapani means the bearer of the thunderbolt. The thunderbolt is one of the uh, earliest and very favored images in Indian philosophy and in Indian art. In fact, uh, the first deity that we see in uh, Indian art is uh, Lord Indra in the Buddhist caves at uh, Bhaja in Maharashtra. And Lord Indra is again uh, the bearer of the thunderbolt. In fact, um, the, uh, uh, the latest form of Buddhism, which is uh, prevalent uh, on a worldwide basis, uh, is also the uh, Vajrayana form of Buddhism, which uh, quite often is called uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Vajrayana also is uh, the vehicle of the thunderbolt because its uh, logic is supposed to be as striking and as clear uh, as a thunderbolt. So here you see in Cape Vana Vajanta, this uh, glorious bodhisattva with his majestic crown, bringing before us the majesty of the spirit 
within us. And again in cave one, the Bodhisattva Padmapani, while uh, the Vajrapani brought uh, before us the majesty of the spirit, the Padmapani brings to us the peace of the spirit within us. Now, if you were to look uh, to your left over his right shoulder, you would see that uh, heavenly musician playing that stringed musical instrument. If you look to your right over his uh, left shoulder, you would see monkeys playing, and above that, geese. Yet, with the activity of life painted around him, he looks within. It is this life of the spirit within, deep within us, which, which is the subject of this great art. This is an art which aims always to take us far from the noise and clamor of the material world outside to the peace which can be found within. Again, in cave one, these paintings of the uh, fifth century, a couple in harmony. And this is a sense of harmony which pervades the world of Ajanta. There are these thousands of figures painted across the walls and all of them exude a sense of uh, harmony of existence. It is this uh, marvelous and compassionate uh, world which is presented to us at Ajanta. In fact, not just presented to us, but draws us in to it, who draws us into this world of harmony. Now, if you observe, there is a, a gradual lightening and deepening of color, which persuades our eyes of the roundedness of form. Such rendering, such shading, is unexpected in paintings of such an early period. But in fact, it is part of the, uh, uh, the tradition of art, which is seen at Ajanta and seen to spread out from Ajanta to all corners of India and from India on to the other countries of uh, Asia. And on the left wall of cave one, the Mahajanak Jatak, Jatak, as uh, you would be aware, means uh, a story of uh, Gautama Siddhartha's previous births in the form of uh, different men and also animals. And here you see him having taken birth as uh, King Mahajanak, who is a figure near the center of the frame, uh, slightly to the right of the exact uh, center of the frame sitting on the ground with his hands before him, looking up at the hermit and listening to his sermon. You might observe that uh, the antelope listened to the sermon of the hermit with as much rapt attention as any of the human figures. For in this vision of life, the antelope, all animals in fact, are no different at all from human beings. They are all jiva, beings like us. I take you to this uh, closer view of uh, King uh, Mahajanak to show you that this, this was in fact uh, a glorious king, a powerful king who had uh, won back the lands earlier lost by his father. But you see the way that he is seated on the ground with his hands before him, looking up in adoration at uh, the hermit. A look of adoration, which even the damage of so many centuries has not managed to remove. It is this uh, humility with which we rise. It is this humility, which is the message of this art. Having heard that uh, sermon, 
King Mahajanat decides to renounce his palace life, his worldly life, and to go out into the forest as an ascetic. Here we see him announcing this decision in the palace. And behind him is his uh, mother, who is uh, obviously rather disturbed to hear her son uh, announcing such a decision. And uh, in front of him is his wife, Queen Shivali. Now, uh, Queen Shivali's eyes are painted in a very particular way. By the time these paintings were made, the oldest known uh, treatise on uh, art making in the world, the Chitra Sutra, had been penned. And the Chitra Sutra gives thousands of guidelines to the artist on how to make landscapes, how to make animals, how to make uh, different kinds of people, how to make different expressions upon their faces. And as part of that, it gives uh, five different shapes of eyes that are to be made to convey different expressions. And uh, Queen Shivali's eyes made here are exactly the shape of one who is sad or weeping, as indeed one can imagine she may be because she hears her husband saying that he is going to go away. Now, her lower garment is woven in the form of uh, ikkat, which is uh, practiced in India till today. Her upper garment, for there is an upper garment which is practically transparent, but you can see some design on it uh, at her hip. This garment reminds us of the fact that India at that time was uh, known around the world for its uh, very fine uh, textiles. There was a flourishing trade uh, of these uh, textiles. And uh, we find uh, Pliny the Elder writing in Rome in the first century that uh, Roman coffers are being emptied for buying too many fine textiles from India. A century later, Emperor Vesuvian is saying practically the same thing. Now, if you were to observe the strings of pearls which dangle below her bosom, you would notice a curve in those uh, pearl strings. And it is this curve which uh, persuades your eye of the movement. And uh, what is marvelous is that these not only are uh, such exquisite details being made in early paintings in the fifth century, but in fact, such details are mentioned for the painter to observe in the Chitra Sutra. The Chitra Sutra expects a very high standard of art from the painter. He expects the artist to be able to depict the movement of uh, leaves in the breeze, to depict the movement of waves upon the water, and all this in a medium which is in fact uh, unmoving. So it is uh, an extremely high uh, standard of art which is already before us as early as uh, the fifth century. Now behind the queen, we see these uh, palace maids. They're responding in shock, as you see clearly written upon the face of the one below, and in sadness, as we, on, as we see on the faces of the other two. To the news that uh, the queen, their mistress, is soon going to be left alone as her husband goes away into the forest. And it is this sense of caring for what happens to others, which fills the world of Ajanta. It is a marvelous world in which there is uh, warmth and compassion and kindness and love everywhere. If you spend time within that world, 
you are always affected deeply by it. It is a marvelous world of compassion. Having taken that decision, having decided, here we see King Mahajanak riding out of the palace. You see that uh, inward look has already come into his eyes. And there's a deep sense of peace that is on him. He begins another journey, a more important journey, a journey within. Cave uh, 17, the uh, Vishwantara Jatak. Excuse me. Prince Vishwantar is another uh, bodhisattva, uh, a previous birth. In fact, uh, the uh, last birth of uh, the bodhisattva before he will be born as uh, Gautama Siddharth, who will uh, gain enlightenment and become a Buddha. And uh, Prince Vishwantar is the uh, dark uh, seated figure that you see here. Now, he has also decided to renounce his uh, palace life and to go into the forest as an ascetic. And he is here telling his wife, Princess Madri, that uh, she should remain behind in the palace as she would not be used to the difficult life outside. The princess, however, decides to go with him. Now, if you observe the uh, purse that she is holding in her hand, you would notice again that curve in those purse strings that shows you that she is swinging that purse. Absolutely marvelous details. Of course, you would notice the uh, perspective in the receding pillars. You would notice the elliptical mouth of the vessel which this man is uh, carrying and so much more that makes this such a beautiful painting. In cave 17, the Mahisha Jataka, Lord Buddha born in a previous life as a Mahisha, a buffalo. You see the uh, pesky monkey troubling him, but the kindly Bodhisattva does not mind. In fact, perhaps the most marvelous thing about uh, the Jataka stories and these wonderful paintings is the depiction of the finest human qualities in the animals. It is something which leaves us with absolutely no sense of differentiation or distinction between us and the animal world. There is such a unity of all of creation which is expressed here. And the best of qualities, in fact, if I may say, qualities better than the ones that we see within ourselves are portrayed so beautifully in the animals. And if you observe, uh, you would see the smile on the face of the Mahesha. And you can be sure that the artist intended for you to see it. Mahesha Jataka, Cave 17, 5th century. And I show you another uh, story from, the, uh, from Cave 17 from the Shaddant Jatak. Now, this uh, Jatak presented before us uh, the uh, uh, large elephants. You can see the feet of uh, one of them uh, to the upper uh, right of the frame. So while the artist was showing such large creatures, he did not forget other creatures of the world. If you look at uh, the branch of the tree close to this man's head, I'll take you to a closer view. And yes, indeed, those are ants climbing up that tree. 
if you were to uh, go to ajanta most likely you will not see them but that did not prevent the artist from making them for the world would not be complete without the ants it's such a wonderful vision of life the completeness of life the wholeness of life and understanding that all of creation is required and all lives and all live together and uh, the artist could very well imagine himself born in a previous birth as an ant much that we could learn uh, from these uh, artists now um, a rarely seen uh, painting of the uh, 5th century these are the buddhist uh, uh, caves at uh, pital khoda about 3 uh, 4 hours drive away from ajanta uh, also within uh, maharashtra and uh, so it's a beautiful site it's a lovely site it's again the gorge of a river and there are uh, magnificent uh, ruins reminding us of the greatness of uh, early heritage and uh, though there is much damage in the paintings and not much uh, survives of the paintings but enough survives to bring before us that tenderness of expression which is a hallmark of this wonderful art again very rarely seen uh, paintings of the 5th century from the buddhist caves at uh, bag in uh, central india now in the state of uh, madhya pradesh and though it is a different state uh, from uh, the earlier caves you saw as a crow, crow flies it is not such a long distance away and all these caves uh, lay originally on uh, trade routes which connected uh, the uh, flourishing port of nalla supara where mumbai is at uh, present uh, with uh, central india that is uh, ujjain which was a great uh, uh, intellectual hub in central india and vidisha which was a granary of uh, central india and uh, traders used the caves for uh, taking shelter while they traverse these uh, routes and uh, for a 5th century painting you may be very surprised to see the four shortening of the bull and uh, the graphic quality of this art may remind you much more of modern art rather than uh, 5th century art amazing uh, amazing painting now the uh, earliest uh, painting which uh, survives of the hindu tradition is of the 6th century from the uh, caves at uh, badami in uh, karnataka and of course uh, these uh, paintings buddhist paintings jain paintings uh, hindu paintings were all made by the same artist there was no distinct uh, a different uh, tradition of uh, art in fact there were guilds of painters and they painted for uh, all the faiths and again though there is so much damage you see that gentleness that kindness of expression that tenderness of expression which is uh, in fact the theme of this uh, ancient art we come up to the uh, 7th century and this is the uh, marvelous temple of uh, kailashnatha at uh, kanchipuram and this is a painting of uh, lord shiva which is uh, made uh, uh, these paintings are made in uh, very deep recesses uh, in an outer uh, ambulatory wall made around the temple the deep recesses in fact you have to poke your head in with a fair amount of difficulty and then you see these uh, 
you see the treasure of this heart. For indeed it is beautiful and it is very important uh, in Indian art history. And uh, Kanchipura was an extremely important uh, uh, city of ancient India. It was a great uh, center of uh, Buddhism, a great center of Jainism, and a great center of uh, Hinduism. <clears throat> In fact, um, if you look at the uh, if you look at the greatest of uh, Buddhist teachers that came out of India, if you look, for instance, at uh, Bodhi Dharma, who spread uh, <clears throat> Buddhism across uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, Bodhi Dharma remains till today, as uh, as my partner Sujata and I discovered, Bodhi Dharma remains till today as. Uh, the most revered uh, deity of Vietnam after Lord Buddha. He is the next most revered deity with a lot of temples uh, dedicated to him. And from Vietnam, he went up into uh, China where he uh, founded uh, Dhyana Buddhism called uh, Chan Buddhism in China. And later when this form moved to uh, Japan, it was called uh, Zen Buddhism. Or if you look uh, two centuries later at uh, Bodhisena, who was invited uh, by the emperor of Japan to come and inaugurate the great uh, <clears throat> Todaiji temple at uh, Nara. These great teachers, Bodhidharma and Bodhisena, are uh, known to have come from uh, Kanchipuram. Kanchipuram was... Uh, very cosmopolitan and uh, uh, great uh, center which was interacting with the rest of the world at that time. <clears throat> and here in, the, in this painting, you see a new sense of uh, regal grandeur which begins to come under uh, the Pallavas and in this tradition of art. I might mention here, that under the Pallavas begins another very important uh, tradition, which is that uh, till before uh, the time of uh, Mahabalapura, all uh, uh, ancient Indian uh, temples and caves were, uh, the, were patronized by the people, not by the kings. Though uh, casual historians of the early period and colonial historians uh, have often made the mistake of saying that uh, so-and-so ancient temple is made by so-and-so king. But when you look at the inscriptions, and there are thousands of such inscriptions which survive, you see that it is uh, fishermen, it is uh, tailors, it is nuns, it is housewives. Uh, and interestingly, half the donations are from women. They are the people who patronized uh, uh, all the ancient art and all the ancient temples and caves of India. This greater monumental heritage which survives from ancient times is in fact uh, made uh, by the people and for the people. Now it is only uh, in the 7th, 8th century under the Pallavas in Tamil Nadu that for the first time uh, kings begin to directly patronize temples. You will begin to see this at uh, Mamalapuram. And, uh, and it, is, uh, it is this which leads to this uh, new sense of uh, royal grandeur which you're seeing before you in this painting of Lord Shiva. And a painting which has hardly been seen at all. And here I am very grateful to National Geographic magazine for having uh, published this photograph, which took this uh, unseen painting immediately before the eyes of uh, uh, millions of people. And this is again of the uh, 7th century of the time of uh, the uh, Pallavas. This is uh, from the Tala Girishwara temple at uh, Pannamalai, high on a hill in a very remote part of uh, Tamil Nadu. It is uh, Parvati. When Shiva dances his uh, cosmic dance, the dance cannot be 
without uh, Parvati as the eternal witness. And when she is made as that eternal witness, she is called Shivakami, as you see her here. And the tenderness of expression on her face, in her eyes, as she looks upon Shiva dancing, makes this one of the beautiful masterpieces of Indian art. Seventh century, Pralankarishwara Temple, Pannamadai. Now, we spoke of uh, changes which came into uh, uh, temple patronage and uh, uh, royal uh, sense which began to come uh, in the 7th, 8th century into uh, Indian art under the Pallavas. Here we move up to the Chola period and the end of the 10th century. And this is the Brahadishwara temple dedicated to the great Lord Shiva in uh, Tanjavur. When this temple was made, <clears throat> it would have been one of the tallest uh, structures in the world. And uh, while uh, ancient uh, Indian uh, temples were all very small, when, uh, the, uh, when the patronage began to be done by the kings, gradually, the sense of grandeur increased. And you see this, uh, this tall structure which can be seen from a long uh, distance. However, it should be observed that uh, the ancient tradition had its own merits. For instance, uh, early caves sometimes used to have uh, uh, some rock left uh, standing outside the cave uh, so that you could not see the cave from a distance. The idea was that you have to make an effort if you want to learn something, if you want to gain knowledge, it is you who have to make an effort. You have to find it, you have to come to it. But uh, gradually with the patronage of kings, a different aspect comes into the making of uh, grand, large temples, which can be seen from a long distance. Now, you can't see it very clearly in this picture, but to the left of the temple tower, there is a metal uh, staircase, which takes us one into a, uh, an ambulatory, a corridor, which runs around the Garbhagraha of the temple. And this ambulatory has only five and a half feet of space between the inner and the outer wall of this corridor. And both the walls have paintings made on them going up to a height of 20 feet. So particularly because you cannot get much distance from which to see the paintings, it enhances the sense of grandeur, the awe-inspiring uh, quality of the paintings. And indeed, the size of this temple, the grandeur of the temple, and these paintings was all designed to bring uh, before us the glory of the Lord. And in fact, also the glory of King Raja Raja Chola, who was a patron of this uh, temple. And these are the uh, grand paintings of the end of the 10th century that you have uh, here. I might mention that uh, these uh, paintings have been covered with plaster and repainted in the uh, 17th century uh, under the Nayak rulers, but the Archaeological Survey of India managed to remove the upper layer and expose these marvelous paintings of the 10th century. And for a long time, uh, French photographers and others were being called to photograph these they were not being able to photograph them because uh, there's not much distance that you can get from the paintings. So the lights that they attempted to use created a lot of surface reflections. When in 91 and 92, I became well known for my uh, technique of photography in low light, I was asked to take photographs of all these paintings, which I did. 
we took about a thousand photographs and documented this uh, this great treasure of uh, early art and this is a painting of uh, a shavite uh, saint sundarar going up to mount kailash sitting on the uh, elephant of lord indra a ravat and the sense of grandeur is is brought across so beautifully in this uh, painting and uh, a detail from these uh, 10th century uh, paintings which uh, shows uh, how much the artist was in control of his medium and being able to depict exactly to convey exactly what he wishes to you see that hand which is poised to strike that little drum you see the straps of the drum which convey so effectively the sense of uh, dynamic movement in the painting the old this is a uh, dead century bradishpura tanjavur tamil nadu and here in the uh, 10th century paintings of uh, the bradishpura temple is the earliest surviving uh, portrait uh, in painting uh, in indian art now uh, perhaps the most uh, marvelous uh, uh, fact about uh, indian art is that for uh, 1500 years though uh, hundreds of thousands of works of art were created which brought before us uh, animals birds trees so many things In, including uh, the common people and jatak stories still uh, there was never a portrait not even of the king under whose rule uh, uh, the art was being created <clears throat> and this was because the personality the ephemeral personality was not considered important enough in fact the chitra sutra is very clear in its stating that uh, that uh, individuals are not important enough to be presented in art art is meant art is something very important it is meant for the eternal themes to bring the eternal realities before us therefore for 1500 years so much art is created but you do not have the representation of any of the kings any of the personalities uh, any of the historical personalities as a matter of fact uh, the artist also does not write his uh, name upon uh, the paintings we do not know who the artists were uh, the the name is not considered important to the extent that uh, even kings of the 3rd century bc period uh, do not write their name below their uh, inscriptions they write only devanam pia pia dasi one who is beloved of the divine and one whose vision is filled with the ad- with adoration a tradition which was followed uh, by others who were following uh, the uh, the indian uh, philosophical traditions at that time at that time uh, the king in uh, sri lanka was calling himself devanam pia pia tisa so much so that uh, when the uh, indian inscriptions were uh, uh, deciphered for the first time historians thought that they were actually inscriptions of uh, the sri lankan king whose inscriptions had been deciphered before but then they realized later that uh, uh, these that uh, this was uh, these are now called the inscriptions of uh, ashoka and uh, even to the northwest of india we find this tradition being followed uh, in the language of aramaic in which uh, jesus christ was to speak uh, uh, three centuries later we find a king uh, following this tradition of uh, devanam pia pia dasi what a marvelous tradition what great humility but there is an evolution 
And by the time we come to the 17th century, uh, under the Pallavas at uh, Mahabalapuram, we see the earliest uh, uh, sculptural representation of a king. And here, in the end of the 10th century at uh, Tanjavur, we find this painting of uh, King Raja Raja Chola, which is the earliest surviving uh, uh, portrait in uh, painting in the Indian uh, tradition. You see him here with his guru, Guru Karuvarar. In later centuries, of course, uh, the uh, images of uh, kings become very common and uh, by the time you reach the medieval period, there is uh, any number of uh, very pompous uh, paintings of uh, kings. And here we move into the, uh, we move beyond the Himalayas into the trans-Himalayan uh, lands of uh, Ladakh and uh, other places. And we see here uh, the uh, monastic complex of Alchi of around the 11th century. Now, uh, 108 legendary monasteries are supposed to have been constructed uh, in this period of time. A marvelous chain of monasteries. And uh, they were all sculpted and painted by artists who were invited from the Valley of Kashmir which was at that time one of the greatest uh, centers of Buddhism and art in the world. So uh, this is fortunate for many reasons because the art which survives, the paintings which survive inside these monasteries are in fact uh, the only remnants of uh, the ancient uh, paintings of uh, Kashmir. And these are these marvelous uh, paintings. This is a green Tara painted uh, in uh, the Sumstik building of uh, Alchi. And you see here the beautiful uh, rendering of form, that exquisite rendering that you saw beginning at uh, Ajanta. The continuing of this uh, classic uh, tradition. And if you observe, the further eye, you see that it is protruding beyond the line of the face. Now, this is uh, an important uh, aspect of uh, the uh, medieval uh, idiom in Indian uh, paintings. So you see the ancient tradition, you see the evolution into the medieval tradition here. And in the profusion of textiles, you see that uh, this was uh, on an artery of the Silk Route, which connected uh, from east to west uh, uh, the lands of China with uh, Europe. And an artery of the Silk Route came down through uh, Kashmir and uh, Ladakh all the way down past uh, Nala Supara to uh, Kerala. In fact, uh, paintings preserved at uh, Alchi uh, depict uh, aspects of uh, Kerala culture, like uh, Kalari Pite is made on the ceiling of uh, one of the monastic buildings at uh, Alchi. Now, if you look to the sides of uh, this painting, you see these uh, figures mounted on uh, mythical creatures and a great sense of joyousness. It is this joyousness which is uh, of a particular note in the art of the uh, Kashmiri painters. It is, uh, it is an art full of this uh, joyousness. You're reminded of the fact that uh, Abhinav Gupt, one of the greatest uh, uh, Indian philosophers of aesthetics, who wrote considerably about joy, was in fact uh, living in the Valley of Kashmir about uh, a century before these paintings were made. And uh, moving uh, down to the extreme uh, south of India, this is uh, 16th century. It is Vinu Kupala, Lord Krishna playing the flute in the, painted in the uh, Matancheri Palace at uh, Kochi. 
and uh, Kerala continues qualities of the ancient uh, paintings much beyond uh, most other uh, uh, parts of the country. Here you see that uh, beautiful, that exquisite uh, rendering of form. The uh, flesh is almost uh, tangible. And you see that uh, beautiful smile upon his face. And I might mention that uh, Vinu Gopala remains still today one of the most uh, popular uh, Indian deities in countries even as uh, far away as Japan. I remember it was uh, Sujata who first uh, discovered and pointed out to me uh, the uh, Vinu Gopala of the 8th century made in a huge uh, lamp at uh, the Todaichi temple at uh, Nara. It was also Sujata who pointed out to me for the first time uh, the modern day uh, a poster of Vinu Gopala in a restaurant in uh, Kyoto. So Indian deities are in fact uh, very commonly uh, worshipped uh, in countries like Japan and, uh, and Vinu Gopala remains one of the uh, very favoured uh, deities. And here we move to the spread of this uh, tradition beyond Indian uh, shores. And you have here a painting from the Sigriya cave of the fifth century in Sri Lanka. And the uh, art historians of Sri Lanka always point out the deep similarities of this art with the paintings of uh, Ajanta. And it is not only the the same themes of Buddhism and the same themes of the making of uh, apsaras bearing uh, offerings. And it is not only the beautiful rendering of form, it is uh, also that, uh, that deep and inward look, those beautifully painted eyes and that exquisite grace, that bending of the neck and that exquisite grace which is found uh, uh, in the paintings of Ajanta, which you see here reflected in uh, Sri Lanka at the, in the exquisite art of uh, Sigiriya. And uh, we move on to the sixth century. <clears throat> and this is uh, China. This is uh, the Kizil Caves at uh, Kucha. Uh, Central Asian part of uh, China, and it is a painting of uh, Shiva and Parvati. And um, Kizil is a particularly important uh, site, and Kucha is very important because it reminds us of uh, the movement of uh, Indian teachers across uh, the whole continent. Uh, Kucha was the home of uh, Kumara Jiva the most important name in uh, Chinese Buddhism, the person whose translations of the Notus Sutra and so many others remain the most popular in China till today. And Kumara Jiva was the son of uh, an Indian uh, Kashmiri Pandit called Kumarayana. <clears throat> and there are these uh, marvelous cultural links across uh, the continent of Asia. And we move on to uh, Myanmar. This is the 12th century. It is uh, the site of uh, Bagan, which has uh, beautiful paintings, which is uh, which uh, paintings which are very similar to the contemporaneous art of the Pala period in uh, the eastern plains of India. And this is the scene of uh, the birth of the Buddha as he emerges from under the arm of. Uh, Queen Maya. And um, the earliest paintings which survive in Tibet are in the Dunkar Caves in an extremely remote and very high altitude uh, art. Uh, these caves are in fact about uh, 14 and a half thousand feet uh, altitude above uh, sea level. Uh, in uh, Western uh, Tibet, a very remote part of Western Tibet, a very beautiful part of uh, Western Tibet. 
but it's in altitude at which uh, my head was really spinning. And uh, these paintings are supposed to have been made uh, in the 11th century by the same uh, Kashmiri painters. However, in my opinion, these were made by uh, people who would have trained under the original Kashmiri painters because uh, the theme is the same, the form is the same, but much of the, uh, the original exquisite, unusual grace of the Kashmiri painters is not quite there. Therefore, this is likely to be uh, people who trained under the Kashmiri painters. And ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of uh, today's uh, presentation. I would be so happy to answer uh, questions if you have. Namaste, Bhimalji. Enjoyed it very Namaste. much. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, you talked about from uh, uh, Kanchipuram, uh, spread of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. And our central deity in our temple is also from Kanchipuram. The How wonderful. So the Varadaraj that we selected is a standing Vishnu which is from the original temple of Kanjipuram, which Sri Devi and Bhu Devi on either side. So a kind of interesting connection there. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Now, is this in the form of a book, Bimalji? Uh, All these pictures that you have beautifully shown? Uh, one book is my book published by Thames and Hudson, London and uh, Harry Abrams, uh, New York, which is the Ajanta Caves. Okay. So, uh, uh, it's it, there've been a number of print runs of that, but uh, I think it may be sold out. And uh, in the coming spring, a uh -huh. new edition uh, is coming out of that book. So uh, you could check if it is available on Amazon. Still, some copies may be there. Okay. But otherwise, uh, in the coming spring, it will be available. The reason I also ask you simply. Because uh, the, your presentation was so impressive and the colors that you described uh, in a poetic style were so satisfying that it is good to have the book so I can really relish what you said this morning to us. Thank you. Hi, Surendra Trivedi here. Uh, isn't there a story about Ajanta that uh, the caves were kind of, you know, unknown for a while and then a Britisher who was hunting uh, shot a tiger, and when he went to the tiger, he found that there were actually these caves. Is that story correct? Or um, As far as the British are concerned, the caves were uh, rediscovered for them by, by this British soldier you mentioned. His name was John Smith. And uh, uh, this was April in the year now, uh, 1819. And uh, you are so right, he was on this hunting expedition and there were many tigers uh, uh, in that uh, gorge of the Vagora River. Yeah. And he was, he, he was so wonderstruck to find uh, that these caves were there. Uh, however, the caves were not always uh, forgotten. As a matter of fact, I found the influence of these uh, Ajanta paintings in... Uh, medieval paintings of uh, the Deccan, the Hyderabad region, for instance. So uh, it, is, uh, it is under the British, they, had, they, were, they were not known until 1819 when uh, John Smith uh, found them. Thank you. I, this marvelous presentation raised so many questions for me, and I have two very specific ones. You made a point of the fact that it was local people who supported the building of temples in an earlier period before the, the influence of the kings. And what I wondered is this, uh, it's one thing to give monetary support. It's something else to have a conception of a temple and a design and to bring everything together. There had to be some leadership in order to accomplish that. And I wondered where that came from. Right. Uh, now, first of all, I'll say a little bit more about uh, the kind of details that we have about this, uh, about this patronage. Uh, 
and then I'll come to the main part of your question. Now, if you look at a monument, for instance, like uh, the Great Stupa at Sanchi, uh, 639 inscriptions still survive there out of what may have been a larger number. And these, as I mentioned, uh, as in the general case, or right across India, are inscriptions of uh, fishermen and tailors and nuns and housewives and so many people uh, stating that, uh, you know, uh, I'm a tailor and I am patronizing the making of this uh, architrave of the gateway. Uh, I'm a housewife and I'm patronizing the making of this uh, pillar, etc. So this is, uh, this is commonplace. This is everywhere, right across the board, in all the ancient uh, monuments of uh, India. And uh, they, the direction of uh, what to do was uh, in the fact that these were guilds of artists. And in the ancient tradition, these guilds were very important. In the ancient tradition, it was the dharma. Of uh, or duty or heritage of uh, different uh, people to do what they had to do. And these guilds were enormous rep repositories of uh, knowledge and art. In fact, it has been found that uh, uh, the knowledge of iconography, for instance, was in fact best maintained even more than the priests knew the iconography. It is the guilds who knew the iconography. It is the guilds who knew the stories, the Jatak stories and so many others. It was, art was a deeply revered uh, calling and it had great responsibilities. You were carrying on the finest and distilled knowledge of uh, ancestors. And that is where this, uh, that is where the concepts which you were asking about, that's where the concepts came from. That's where, in fact, the details also came from. Mm. And it is very interesting to note that uh, nobody was telling them what to do. They were patronizing because it was the duty of uh, the people, it was the dharma of people to patronize the making of uh, such uh, monuments and art. But if you have thousands of people patronizing different parts of it, you, can you imagine what chaos there would be if each person would say that this is what I want made? So it is uh, the concepts and the themes and the details were all left to the people who it should have been left to. And that was the guilds of artists. This is something I feel that uh, the world could learn a lot from today. Because in fact, uh, when art is commercial, when art is dependent upon uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, appreciation of the patron or the command of the patron, then it is not art. Art should come from within. And it should be the duty of society to preserve its own traditions by patronizing the art. So in this tradition of art, which was so intimately connected with the purpose of art, which was to carry on the philosophic understanding of, uh, of uh, society, uh, all this was beautifully maintained. As a matter of fact, we'll get other occasions during, the, during this course to talk about the social contract. Thank you very much. That, that is a totally amazing story to me. And it also raises the second question that I had, it's closely related, which is in the case of a painting, for example, was the painting created by a single painter or was there collaboration on the part of a group of associated painters who jointly created what we see today? Well, we do not have any direct uh, evidence to speak about what was happening within each uh, uh, painted frame. But uh, definitely there were uh, large numbers of, uh, of painters. 
it is also known that uh, it is the same artists who were making sculptures and paintings oh. in fact the relationship between b- between those arts and the kinds of uh, the kinds of nuances which are being made in those uh, arts are also very uh, very similar and striking do we know the guilds were they by birth is like like jati or is it by you know uh, joining a school like gurukul where they learn the art and then you know there is a movement between society you know someone wants to oh i i feel like being artist so he joins the school uh, it's hard to know at this time but in case we have any insight yes 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 sir and in fact uh, uh, we do have records uh, going back even earlier than this time and we begin to learn from uh, the writings of uh, greeks persians and other visitors going back to the bc period that uh, uh, there was no rigid uh, jatis in india it was there was a lot of movement it was open it was uh, so there was freedom in fact uh, you would if you start looking at uh, the upanishads if you start looking at the writings uh, the great epics of india you will notice that uh, most of the time it is in fact people who uh, were born in the lowest of castes who have written the greatest of epics and the greatest of philosophical works of india so there was complete movement it was uh, not just by birth it was definitely open for people to uh, it was their actions it was by the doing that uh, you decided your uh, vocation and your position in uh, society so the rigid caste system is in fact uh, uh, comparatively very recent phenomenon thank you thank you very much abel ji for mm-hmm. the great presentation i have one question i know that uh, recently the uh, uh, art of uh, painting on the walls was revived in kerala uh, after a fire at uh, guruvayurappan temple uh, is there artists like that throughout india right now you see uh, in every line which is made by the artist he paints himself it is the being of the artist it is the soul of the artist which is uh, which is seen in the art which he creates which is what makes uh, all art so individualistic and it makes some art uh, truly great so i do believe that uh, in ancient times we had uh, we had a depth of understanding and we had a depth of compassion and kindness and there was a grace which uh, may not be very easy to uh, find in uh, life uh, today uh-huh. therefore uh, what we have today is a much more uh, commercial mindset it is much more confusion that uh, that natural grace which uh, which transports us which helps us to which helps us to understand the truth which is behind uh, all our material concerns which help helps us to give up our material concerns and to concentrate on the joy and grace which there is inside now i we would really need to and i believe we should try to create uh, uh, this in society because the painted art or the sculpture is only a manifestation of the art that has to be within so it is uh, it is really this which we should work upon right from our uh, early uh, earliest uh, school going children uh, to later the concepts which are also called yoga which is uh, kindness and grace and so many other things should be inculcated in uh, in the way that we live in the way that we understand our life and then we would be in a position to uh, to create that kind of art again that would indeed be wonderful thank you that, that-
thank you very much uh, that's the insight that's a feeling that i have i was uh, feeling myself you expressed it and you can you defined it my much better than it was in my mind when i asked that question it to some extent thank you very much for bring that out and expressing it properly and that's what i find not just in art but that missing in indian life now uh, it, just like you said art can only reflect what you know it should reflect what is in the in the life thank you yes. the the entire world has become a, a much more commercial and a much more uh, confused place we need to dispel these confusions in fact uh, the dwarf uh, that shiva tramples under his foot while he dances is apasmara the uh, the demon of the forgetfulness of the truth it is not hmm. no, not even ignorance it is forgetfulness of the truth okay. because somewhere that uh, that capacity to see the truth is within each of us and 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 the shiva within us has to trample that apasmara and we should be able to see the truth and the grace again thank you thank you thank you maybe <laughs> people be inspired by people <clears throat> like you to bring that out i think we need more of more of that thank you thank you thank you and vinay ji one more question i remember receiving a email after your travel to europe so there you have found the motifs in the early churches of the europe and they were same as motifs you found in the indian paintings much earlier or something if you remember uh, yes 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 in fact what I is the connection that. of european art and indian art right yes in fact i had published uh, uh, articles also about this uh, around that time many years ago yes you have a very good memory um you see um european art historians were not very aware of uh, ancient indian art as is seen in the uh, sculptures of uh, the uh, buddhist uh, uh, early buddhist uh, stupas and then later on in uh, so many uh, hindu temples and jaina temples so they were not aware that uh, what you know, what we see in uh, early churches in portugal i found it in portugal i found it in spain i found it in italy the um, the essential themes of art of the ancient uh, period showing the showing the profusion of the life of the world showing uh, uh, showing uh, creatures that are uh, composite creatures and uh, uh in fact i I'll, i'll try to weave this in because this will need uh, this will need much more illustration so i will try to weave this in at some point during the course that i give and i'll also try to locate uh, links to uh, to these articles if i can find them and i will send them to you and maybe you can circulate these links also to others in the audience but uh, this was indeed you are good you are right in remembering that it was uh, it was a very interesting discovery to find that uh, uh, perhaps through the early greeks and then later through the uh, arab rulers of spain and portugal these uh, ideas coming from uh, from india and uh, coming from the most ancient art of india in fact onwards were transmitted and i found them very comprehensively portrayed in exactly the same fashion in early european churches so i'll try to find you these links and tell you more in detail about it thank you 